thanks for coming along tonight where we have a at the Sydney Institute another discussion on the voice we've had quite a few and there'll be more to come um, on this time um, our speakers are um, I'll introduce him briefly in a minute but um, Chris Merritt and he's got a, an essay in this book Beyond Belief and there are copies of that for sale tonight and our other speaker of course is George Williams he's got a book coming out um, with Megan Davis and we'll have them back at the Institute uh, later on. Uh, now I introduce our two speakers and the topic is The Voice, The Legal Realities. We're going to start off with Professor uh, George Williams who is Professor of Constitutional Law at the University of New South Wales. He's a barrister, uh, he's an author and he's also a columnist for The Australian. Chris Merritt is Vice President of the Rule of Law Institute and he's also a columnist for The Australian. So we're going to start off with George Williams, we'll go to Chris Merritt, we'll go to questions and discussion. Thank you. George. Well, thanks very much. Uh, it's always a pleasure to speak for the Sydney Institute. Thanks for coming to hear about The Voice, The Legal Realities. What I'm going to do is to start with a particular legal reality about our Constitution, which explains why we're having this debate today. And then what I'm going to do is to turn to the wording of the referendum that's been put forward by the government and is currently being considered by Parliament. And of course, that wording isn't necessarily the final wording. Parliament has the final say when it comes to what change goes to the Constitution. So we may yet see some movement. And indeed, I know Julian Lisa, for example, the Shadow Attorney General, has himself put forward suggestions today that may yet see alterations. So the first reality I want to speak to for this debate is the state of our current Constitution. We have one of the oldest constitutions in the world and a very successful one when it comes to founding a continuous and stable democracy. But it is also a constitution that bears all the hallmarks of its time. It was drafted in the 1890s and at that point Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples played no meaningful role in the drafting of the document. They were not representatives at the conventions that drafted the constitution. Mostly they were not permitted to vote for representatives nor were they given a vote in the referendums on whether to endorse the constitution at the colonial level. And what we have today is a constitution that bears the hallmarks of that history. It's a constitution that begins with a preamble which speaks to the nation's history under the crown but makes no reference whatsoever to the tens of thousands of years habitation of this continent. And when it comes to the operative provisions of the constitution, those provisions were drafted to take into account the intentions of the framers at the time, which were to treat Indigenous peoples as a dying race. And those are the words that were often used by framers and others. So those provisions in our constitution include still section 25 of the document, which permits people to be disqualified from voting in state elections because of their race. And as far as I'm aware, there is no other constitution in the world that still has a clause that permits race-based voting in its national constitution. It's obsolete in the sense we would not imagine any state would take advantage of that clause to deny Indigenous or other peoples the vote, but it's still in our constitution today. We have two other clauses still in the, one still in the document, one repeal, that have been affected by the 1967 referendum. One of those, the repeal provision in section 127, said that it was not permissible to count Aboriginal peoples and Torres Strait Islander peoples in reckoning the numbers of people in the Commonwealth. That provision was removed. It obviously had a racially discriminatory foundation and the people chose to take it out of the Constitution in 1967. The other clause that is still in the Constitution but amended in 1967 is the racist power. It permits the federal parliament to make laws for the people of any race and by 1967 that power was extended to indigenous peoples. Now that racist power was put in the constitution primarily for a negative purpose. If you look for example to the words of Edmund Barton, our first prime minister, he said that we need the racist power in the constitution and I quote, to regulate the affairs of the people of coloured or inferior races who are within the commonwealth. And there were many examples put how we needed federal laws that might, for example, prevent immigration of certain races or prevent races living in areas reserved for the British colonists. And that racist power has never been amended to make, make it clear it can only be used for a positive purpose. To this day, it's in the Constitution with its overt discriminatory past. Uh, 
And it's one, again, of the animating features as to why we are having this debate today. When we put these things together with our constitution as it stands, we have a constitution that makes no mention of the First Peoples of Australia. The preamble, which is used in education and other forums, simply treats our First Peoples as if they don't exist. Where we do have mention of any issues relating to Indigenous peoples, it's through the lens of race, a 19th century concept which, again, no constitution today would countenance but for the fact we have a constitution that has not been amended for many, many decades. So we have a constitution that permits discrimination against Indigenous peoples and a constitution that otherwise fails to mention them and their history as part of our nation's founding or the fact indeed that the nation was formed on their ancestral lands. It's no surprise given that legal reality that it gave rise to a movement that has spanned decades seeking justice and change for the constitution. That culminated initially in 1967 where we had a referendum supported by 90% of the community, our most successful referendum ever, where we made some changes to the constitution to extend the racist power to Indigenous peoples and to take out the clause that said Aboriginal peoples could not be counted. But there was nothing positive put in the document and it left unfinished business that to this day demands further change and indeed explains why we have seen such a long running movement to bring about constitutional reform. That movement culminated at Uluru in 2017, where as a result of dialogues, Indigenous peoples from across our land and waters sought three things. They sought a voice that would enable them to have a say on laws and policies that would affect them. They sought treaties by which Australia, being the only Commonwealth nation never to have entered in treaties with Indigenous peoples, would change that through agreements to provide for mutual coexistence. And thirdly, they sought a process of truth-telling to shine a light on our history and to provide a basis for shared understanding. Of those three things, voice, treaty and truth, the only one that requires constitutional change is voice. And that's because the Uluru delegates said they needed a permanent change to our system of government, one that would not be subject to the vagaries of government of the day, one that would be put beyond parliament and politics of the day, that would guarantee them a say in the making of laws and policies. And so here we are, nearly six years later, on the cusp of a referendum where we have the wording of what the voice might look like if agreed to by Parliament. And indeed, that wording, as we know, was first announced by the Prime Minister at Gama in July of last year, and since then has been subject to feedback by an Indigenous working group and also a constitutional experts group, of which I am a member. And that led to revised wording, which was released a couple of weeks ago, which made a number of significant and I think important changes to improve the wording before it went into Parliament. Now, the wording itself you've got on your chairs or if you're on the Zoom, hopefully in the chat. And these are the three sentences that the government is proposing to Parliament will be put in the Constitution. Now, it's always fair to say that there are many ways you could have encapsulated the voice. There are always differences amongst lawyers as to how you capture the intention. To my mind, this represents a sensible and sound way of doing so, not the only way by many means, but a very reasonable and appropriate way of doing so. What the words do in three sentences is establish there will be a voice. It establishes that the voice can make representations to Parliament and the Executive of the Commonwealth on matters relating to Indigenous peoples. And thirdly, it says that Parliament has an ongoing role to set out how the voice will operate and to make sure that as the generations pass, the voice and its operation reflect lived experience and the attitudes of the community. And Parliament in that third paragraph is given the upper hand on almost all of the key aspects of the voice, its composition, powers, procedures and the like. Now, when it comes to understanding the legal effect of the voice and what it would achieve in those three sentences, there's a few points that I'll draw out to help you understand how I, as a constitutional lawyer, would analyse the voice. The first thing is when I look at how the wording has been crafted, I do see this as modest and constrained. It clearly establishes an advisory body to Parliament and the Executive that may make representations. And that word has been very carefully chosen. It doesn't say it's direction. It doesn't say it's a veto. It only has the power to make representations. 
Now, it's just plain English. To understand that means you can communicate something. You can represent something. It does not place an obligation on Parliament or the executive as a result. It captures the fact that this is an advisory body without veto. What the wording in that second clause only guarantees is that these representations or advice can be made to the Commonwealth, Parliament and Executive. There's no right to make them to state parliaments, to the United Nations, to any other body. Now, Parliament could extend that to other bodies if it wishes, but that would be a matter for Parliament, and it could do so according to the wisdom of the time. It means, for example, South Australia, which is bringing about its own voice to Parliament, can continue to do so. This is a voice to the Commonwealth, and it enables our federal system, respectfully, to continue experimentation and models as it wishes at the state and territory level. The third thing to say about this advisory body, as I've already hinted, is there's nothing in this wording that places any obligation constitutionally upon Parliament or the executive. What it says is make representations. There is no requirement in this wording for Parliament or the executive to wait for the advice. It can proceed if it wishes to do so. There's no requirement for Parliament or the executive to solicit a representation on any matter. It's up to the voice to make representations. It may do so, not shall. There's no mandatory language. And so it's at that point a one-way street in a sense of giving the voice the power to make representations but not placing obligations upon Parliament or the Executive. The second thing that arises clearly from this wording as a matter of legal example is that that third clause makes it clear that Parliament has the key role of determining how the voice will operate. Now, one significant change that the government brought about from the Prime Minister's Gama wording to what was released a couple of weeks ago was to greatly expand the role of Parliament. Initially, in the Gama wording, it was only to make laws about composition, functions, powers and procedures. What the government has suggested is this should be broadened out that the parliament can make laws generally with respect to the voice. And that means that if there's any doubt about whether the parliament could legislate on a topic, that's been removed. And these words are as broad as you typically get in the constitution when it comes to making laws on a particular topic by parliament. Now, one thing the Parliament could do is it could make laws about the legal effect, for example, of representations by the voice, or when it makes representations, how it makes representations. It can essentially condition those things according to parliamentary direction. The third point is that the voice is clearly established as a political institution, as it must be. Its success will live or die according to its influence in the political realm. If its representations are unpersuasive, they won't be influential. The voice will not have an impact upon political debate. And that's the way this should operate. It should be a political institution. That said, um, I acknowledge and actually welcome the fact that at times there will be a role for the High Court in playing an interpretive role in examining the operation of the voice. One really obvious example is that the High Court, as with any institution, must make sure the voice operates within its remit. It can make representations about matters relating to Indigenous peoples. If it makes a representation about something having nothing to do with Indigenous peoples, you could seek an injunction in the High Court to say the voice is operating outside of its terms. And that's a basic facet of our system of government that any public institution can be held to its terms, as the voice should be. In the case of Parliament, there's no real realistic prospect that it could be subject to High Court litigation if it ignored the voice, refused to even read its representations. And that's because the High Court has said consistently over the century that it will simply not intervene in the internal workings of Parliament. That's a matter for parliamentarians and not for the High Court. Where I think there might be a role for the voice, which has been for the courts, which has been more controversial, is scrutinising the work of ministers and public officials when it comes to representations made by the voice. Now, our system of law is recognised for decades that when a decision maker exercising power on behalf of the community makes a decision, they need to take into account all relevant factors or considerations. That's just good decision making. It means here that it is possible that if the voice made a representation about a matter and a minister or public official refused to even read the representation, that it might go to court and the court might say that decision was poorly made. The process was wrong, 
The voice can't direct the outcome, but you must read everything relevant to making that decision. That's the bread and butter of administrative law in Australia. Happens all the time. The worst would be the court might say, go back and make it again. Read the representation and make up your own mind. Can't direct the outcome, but get the process right, is what a court might say. And to give you a more specific example is if a minister was making a decision about whether to impose an alcohol ban in an area that affected an Indigenous community and the voice had made a representation saying this is how it would affect the community, this is how it might affect women in the community, a range of factors clearly relevant to the decision, and the minister said I'm not even reading it, well maybe the minister would be asked to go back and read it and make the decision again. But to my mind that's actually how the system ought to operate. The voice can make representations, ministers and public officials should listen where it is relevant but are free to make the decision as they wish. They just have to make sure they take account of all relevant factors. So for me, when I look at the operation of the voice, I do see it as modest. I see it building into our system as it should work. The High Court has the job of interpreting the Constitution. These provisions would be the same as any other text in the Constitution. Of course they'll be interpreted by the High Court. That's its job to do so. And that interpretation is actually the rule of law in action in our society. We expect independent judges to ensure compliance with the terms of this document. And I'd also say that the fact that the High Court would have a role to do so, for me, provides confidence that this will operate as it should and that the community, I think, can support this change with confidence knowing that there will be judicial oversight to ensure that consistent with how this document works, the voice, like any other part of the Constitution, would be held to account and would operate as the text would require. Thank you. Many thanks. Thanks, uh, George Williams. So we continue at us. Our topic, The Voice, The Legal Realities, Two Views, and Chris Merritt's going to give us his view. <coughs> Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Jared. Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, before we start, I want to thank the Sydney Institute and Malisons for hosting this event, which will hopefully get to the core of what this referendum is all about. I also want to make it clear that while George Williams and I might hold in fact do hold, uh, different opinions about the, the issues under discussion. George is a friend of long standing and I hold him in the highest regard as an authority on constitutional law. I want to start by making it clear that I've long held the view that constitutional recognition of Indigenous people is desirable and can be achieved. The great tragedy is that the change we are now being asked to make would damage our system of government and is wrong in principle. The principle I'm talking about is this. The sovereignty of the land on which we meet today derives from the people of this nation, all of them, regardless of race or national origin and regardless of whether they arrived yesterday or whether they, they have antecedents who arrived 60,000 years ago. Until now, this idea has led to ever-increasing moves towards strengthening equality of citizenship, which is fundamental to all true democracies. But we are now at a turning point. In the remarks that follow, I'll be making the case that the change proposed at the coming referendum would take us back to the days when racial privilege was this country's official policy. It took us generations to rid ourselves of that blight and replace it with a system that gives growing effect to the idea that everybody should be equal not just before the law, but before those who make the law, our elected members of parliament. It makes no sense to abandon this principle, which is fundamental to all true democracies, when those who oppose this form of government are on the march internationally. I'll also be making the case that while constitutional recognition of Indigenous people is necessary, this referendum is the wrong way to achieve that goal. It's simply incorrect to equate opposition to an Indigenous voice to Parliament and the Executive with opposition to constitutional recognition of Indigenous people. Most people of goodwill would readily accept a constitutional change that recognised Indigenous people were the first occupants of this continent. But here's the harsh truth about this referendum. 
Explicit recognition of Indigenous people was actually an afterthought. It was added months after the preliminary wording of the proposed change to the Constitution was made public in July last year. The real purpose of this referendum, and you can see this in the, the form of words that we'll be, be voting on, is to change our system of government by injecting a permanent element of racial privilege into the heart of the Constitution. This would risk placing this country in breach of international law. It would also open the door to a New Zealand-style system of co-governance that would kill the doctrine of equality of citizenship. It would give Indigenous Australians and their descendants for all time a second method of influencing public policy that goes beyond the benefits of representative democracy that are already available to all citizens regardless of race. It would constitutionalise a race-based lobby group equipped with a separate bureaucracy that would give Indigenous citizens the ability to have an additional say on every law and administrative decision, not just those relating specifically to Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders. Constitutional recognition of Indigenous people is a worthwhile goal, but not like this. Because this racial preference would be entrenched in the Constitution, it would be permanent, and that would put Australia at odds with the International Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, which this country ratified in 1975. But you'd never know that by reading the official material tabled in Parliament last week by the government. Article 1.4 of that treaty makes it clear that special measures to secure the advancement of certain racial groups are not discriminatory, provided they do not lead to the maintenance of separate rights for different racial groups and that they shall not be continued after their objectives have been achieved. When the government unveiled the, the, its final form, its proposed final form, for the constitutional change, it was accompanied by a statement of compatibility with human rights. Nowhere in that statement is there any mention of Article 1.4 and its requirement that race-based mechanisms to improve the standing of particular groups should be temporary and should be terminated when their goals have been achieved. This is despite the fact that the International Convention is included in the definition of human rights under the Human Rights Parliamentary Scrutiny Act. That flaw is the latest problem in a referendum process that's been notable for secrecy, dissembling and minimal involvement by the general community. We are asked to make a major change to our system of governance by inserting a new chapter in the Constitution where it will sit alongside chapters dealing with Parliament, the executive and the judiciary. This is not modest, it's not symbolic. Yet the broader community has had no involvement in developing the proposed provision, which was drawn up in secret by insiders and sprung on the nation last July. The true nature of this change only emerged from leaks and anonymous guidance from lawyers who feared for their professional future if they put their names to their concerns. There has been no convention, no constitutional convention, at which the views of the general community could be assessed and incorporated into the proposed change. This is at odds with the fact that the Constitution is owned by the entire community, not insiders and not politicians. What we are left with is a parliamentary inquiry that again leaves politicians and insiders in the driving seat. The problem with the current model for The Voice comes down to three associated issues. The first is the unlimited scope of the subject matter with which it can involve itself. The second is the fact that it will be empowered to make representations that reach into the executive branch of government and not just the parliament. And the third is the fact that the High Court and not Parliament will have the final say on whether any limits can be imposed on the scope of its subject matter and its reach into the executive. Those who point out that the third clause in the proposed provision would give Parliament the power to make laws about the voice's proposed powers have clearly missed the real point about that provision. At the moment, the power to make representations that reach into the executive branch is unlimited. 
The only limit on the scope of subject matter is that it must relate to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And that is no limit at all. Because Indigenous people, like all citizens, can be affected by all laws and policies. Tax laws can relate to Indigenous people, as do decisions about whether military alliances would expose citizens who happen to be Indigenous to the risk of enemy action. There is no requirement in the provision for the voice to be limited to matters that relate only or specifically to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. It's futile to argue that the new institution would never use its powers to involve itself in matters that are only marginally of, of, that have only a marginal effect on Indigenous people. If that is the case, why give it the power to do so? While the new provision would give Parliament authority to make laws about the powers of the voice, that needs to be considered in context as well. The same clause that would give Parliament that power, Clause 3, also makes it clear that this power would be bestowed subject to this Constitution. And that invokes Chapter 3 of the Constitution, which vests the judicial power of the Commonwealth in the judiciary, not the Parliament. Parliament might try to make laws limiting the legal effect of representations by the voice, but those laws would be vulnerable to challenge if they infringe the powers of the judiciary. Once a provision is inserted into the Constitution, its meaning and the resulting implications become the ultimate responsibility of the court, not the Parliament. So, if, after the referendum, Parliament tries to legislate to limit the scope and reach of the voice, that legislation would be subject to interpretation by the court. And because the proposed constitutional provision contains no real limits on the scope and reach of the voice, any legislative attempt to impose restrictions after a successful referendum could, and probably would, be struck down as inconsistent with the unlimited reach and scope outlined in the constitutional provision. This raises the question about whether the government is really serious about preventing the voice from making representations to certain parts of the executive and preventing it from involving itself in certain public policy debates. At the moment, the explanatory memorandum to the Constitution Alteration Brackets Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Voice Bill makes a series of assertions about the second clause of the provision that are best described as speculative, if not courageous. It will be recalled that the unlimited nature of the second clause would empower the voice to make representations to Parliament and the Executive on matters relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Yet at paragraph 14 of the Notes to Clauses, the memorandum asserts that Parliament and the Executive would not be required to wait for the voice to make a representation on matters before taking action, nor would the executive be required to seek representations before enacting any law or making any decisions, at least according to that document. The basis for these assertions is not provided. Now consider how this might be presented to the High Court. If the Constitution empowers the voice to make representations Surely that would give rise to an implication that the representations should be listened to. And if representations are to be made, surely there would be another implication that the voice should be provided with information about pending decisions. Otherwise, how would it be possible to make representations in the first place? The reality is that the referendum would amount to a massive transfer of policy-making power from Parliament to the High Court. That needs to be clearly understood before we vote on this proposal. The great tragedy, and it is a tragedy, is that these difficulties could have been avoided if the referendum had focused on something achievable. There is a legitimate argument that Indigenous people should be heard before Parliament makes special laws about them under the Constitution's race power under Section 5126. In practice, that power has only been used to make laws, special laws, about Indigenous people, Indigenous affairs. So because Indigenous people are the only Australians singled out by race for special laws on that basis, there is a logical argument 
for a match, to match that power with a requirement that they should be heard before that power under section 5126 is exercised. It would therefore make sense to establish a voice if it were limited to providing advice to Parliament, not the executive, on laws enacted under 5126. It might even be feasible to give it a flexible boundary so it could provide advice on matters that have a specific impact on Indigenous people that goes beyond the impact on the general community. But even then, it should not be part of the Constitution. If such a redesigned voice were statutory instead of constitutional, it would not be permanent, so it would not appear to infringe the requirements of the Convention against racial discrimination. Once the goals of such a mechanism were achieved, such as closing the gap on Indigenous disadvantage, the statute establishing the voice could be repealed. That would achieve the goal of the Convention, which is best described as equality of citizenship, which is where we started. But such a mechanism is not on the table. The government and its team of insiders has seen to that. The tragedy is that a reasonable form of constitutional recognition accompanied by a statutory voice of defined reach and scope would almost certainly split the no vote at the coming referendum. The current proposal will probably do the reverse. That we are faced, what we are faced with is a proposal that is shot through with uncertainty, that would transfer policy making power to the High Court and which would probably put this country at risk of breaching one of its international treaty obligations. If this provision remains unchanged, the government might eventually need to consider withdrawing its ratification of the Convention Against Racial Discrimination. That might be the logical way of reintroducing racial preference as a permanent part of the Australian system of governments, governance. And I don't think we want to go there. George, if you come up to here, and uh, we'll take questions and discussion. Uh, as I said, uh, Chris has uh, an article in Beyond Belief, Rethinking the Voice of the Parliament, and I, Warren Mundine, the co-editor of this book, is here tonight. So, And we're going to have uh, George back when his book with Megan Davis comes out later in the year. So I just uh, everyone's got to be very brief today because there are a lot of people here. So I'll just start off very briefly. How, How would, would you, you just... I know you're speaking about the political realities... Uh, the, the legal realities, what about the political realities? What would it be? Would it be a building? What's, I mean, you know what the High Court is. What would the voice, how do you envisage it? Let's start with George. Go to Chris and we keep everything short. Yep. Uh, look, I haven't actually given much attention to what sort of building they would get. I doubt they would. I mean, it's what we will find is that Parliament, if the referendum is successful, will itself set down how the voice will operate, which is the normal way we deal with constitutional change followed by Parliament legislating. You may well find that the Secretariat is based within another department. That's probably the most likely, given how other like bodies have been supported. And then the voice itself would meet in whatever convenient place was required. But you'd expect that they would take advantage of the facilities that the Com Authority has, which are significant. Um, look, I think the answer is unknown, and I think that's um, part of the problem. If we're going to constitutionalise uh, a new institution, we need to have a little bit more detail on the table. Not chapter and verse, but a, a broad brush idea of what we're talking about here, rather than just um, a feel-good, let's do the right thing proposal. Before I go to the next question, I should, say, I should have said at the part, uh, earlier on, thanks to King and Wood Mellisons for the use of this great facility this evening. There's a question over there. Uh, George, you come closer here. And Chris, you come closer. Thanks. Um, I'd like George to uh, explain, specify for us those characteristics of the voice that will be constitutionally guaranteed. Which, what does the Constitution protect about the voice? So the question is, what parts of the voice would be constitutionally guaranteed? What characteristics of the what voice? Characteristics of the voice. So, like, was, would it be representative? Or whatever? Okay. So the characteristics that would be constitutionally guaranteed are that the voice shall be in the form of a body of some kind. That means 
could be a corporation, could be an institute, not quite sure how it'd be set up, but it will be a body of some kind. We also know that it will be able to make representations to the Commonwealth Parliament and Executive on the matters referred to, and otherwise Parliament itself is left to determine those other characteristics. Um, there's not much, I mean, there's not much more to be said beyond that. It leaves it to Parliament, essentially, to work those things out. So as to issues as to its level of independence from other arms of government, particularly, for example, the executive, so its secretariat, there's no requirement that it has an independent secretariat that could be provided by an existing department if required. But it's been carefully crafted because other than there being a body called the voice that can make representations, essentially Parliament is left to work those things out. Um, it's not more specific than that. And I'd just refer you to the wording, which sets out the totality of what would be put in the Constitution. Would you comment on that? Yep. Um, look, I, I, uh, I compare and contrast. Uh, at Federation, it was considered blindingly obvious that Section 9, what Section 92 of the Constitution meant, trade, commerce and intercourse among the states shall be absolutely free. Um, in the hands of the High Court, it now means almost the complete reverse. It shall not be absolutely free unless the High Court says meets these, this little checklist. That's the danger. Um, there, there are too many unknowns about what flows from representations, the implications that I referred to. Uh, it's, it's asking the High Court to effectively fill in the gaps that have been left. It's too, too open-ended. The, the record of the High Court, not just on Section 92, but the, um, the very recent Love and Tom's decision, shows the Court has a, uh, a strong propensity for creativity when it comes to Indigenous affairs. And on, on this matter particularly, I think it's important that if we're going to change the Constitution, we leave the court very, very little room for creativity because they'll drive a truck through it if you, if you leave a gap. Here's a question. If you got the microphone, you've got the question, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, one of the things that I wonder about is uh, the statements that Professor Megan Davis and others make to the effect that it's necessary to have the constitutional change so that the voice may make representations. The implication would seem to be that without it, they may, people you know, in other groups or individuals may not make representations. How does that fit with the concept of the right to petition parliament or government, which as I understand it, I'm not a lawyer, goes back in some form to Magna Carta and which we all from time to time uh, make use of in irritating our okay. parliamentarians and okay. governments. Okay, right, who wants to lead off, George? Sure, and, and the right to petition is unaffected. It's still there, of course. It's not affected by this amendment and people could continue to petition as they wish to do so. What this would do is in addition to that petition process is guarantee the ability of the Indigenous peoples who make up the voice to provide representations to Parliament, the executive, and that would be an additional method to petitions. But I think the reason that they wouldn't rely solely on petitions is there's not a great track record of petitions actually being listened to or proving to be effective. Chris, do you want to make a comment on that? Uh, this goes um, directly to the point I made about uh, duplicating existing mechanisms. There's, every citizen already has the, the ability to make a representation to parliaments, to their local member, to uh, agencies of the executive. Uh, what we're talking about is creating a, a publicly funded lobby group for one single interest group. Um, it, it, I see it as about as legitimate as constitutionalising the ACTU or the Business Council and providing them with um, taxpayer-funded resources so that they can go about their business more effectively. I, I don't think it makes any sense. There's a question here. Um, thank you. I, I, um, in the last few weeks, we've seen a deal announced between the Greens and the government on um, carbon emissions, which um, the Greens say, this is great, this has knocked out 116... Um, fossil fuel projects, um, which one assumes are by and large um, in rural areas, okay. by and large with greater than indigenous proportions of population. 
Um, that decision was made in the time period between the election of the Labor government and you know last week, a relatively short okay, period. You've got to be brief. Okay. My my question is, um, if this const if this constitutional amendment was in effect, would that decision not have been possible to have been made as a matter of government policy okay. in the absence of representations? Okay. Uh, and. The voice won't affect the ability of government or parliament to make the decisions it wishes. It's possible with the executive they may need to follow a process that listens to the representation, determines whether in fact to give it weight or disagrees with it, but there's no fetter at all upon what the executive or parliament may decide to do. So any law can still be enacted, the executive can make a decisions. And the well-trodden um, path of administrative law in Australia, which this will link into, is that at best it might be a decision needs to be remade where the person has failed to consider the voice, even if it's to reject it. Bruce, do you want to make a comment on that? Yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. Um, I'd go, go one step further. Um, we, we won't know until after the referendum whether there's also a constitutional implication for agencies of the executive to provide information in advance so that the voice is aware of coming decisions so that it is able to make representations. I don't see how it, it can exist and make representations unless it knows what it's making representations about. Chris, can you just speak up a little bit, Chris? So, question here. I think I might have asked this question before to some of the people who've spoken here, but it still puzzles me how we'll close the gap with a voice to federal parliament or even federal executives, when so much of the lives of Indigenous Australians is really governed by the states and the territories. So where, do the, where does the voice make a difference? How can federal government make a difference, even if it does accept recommendations by the voice? It doesn't have the power to do those things. Okay, question about the state and territories. And, and the first point is that the states and territories may well have their own voice. South Australia is, in fact, legislating for that for the reason you say. And it's also the case that the reason the closing the gap statement is read out in the federal parliament is because the federal parliament does have enormous capacity to influence those outcomes, most significantly through funding. Um, the states and the territories rely upon federal funding for Indigenous-specific programs in education, health, policing and other areas. And that's the sort of area you would expect the voice would make representations as to how that funding can be best directed to have an impact? Uh, look, I, I share your concern. I, I, it gets down to a question of expertise. Um, uh, what possible expertise could 24 people, um, Indigenous people, who are, will not necessarily be elected, uh, what possible expertise would, would they have to make an informed decision on, on most areas of public administration. They'd, they'd definitely need to be supported by a bureaucracy. Uh, it's, um, it's bigger than Ben-Hur. Your question here. Taking up Mr Merritt's point... Got to talk into the right. Taking up Mr Merritt's point, first of all, there seems to be an assumption that the voice will be unanimous what happens if there are divergent voices, which I would have thought, frankly, was highly probable. The second thing is taking up Mr Merritt's point about referring the uh, reference. If there is to be a considered view expressed on, for example, whether or not Australia declares war, it would be very simple for the High Court to say that these people must have a reasonable opportunity to consider what their recommendation is going to be. Okay, we've got it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, George? So, I, I think, as I've acknowledged, um, I, I think there is prospect for the High Court to interpret how these clauses will work. As I've also said, that's the way it should work. But I, I would say that many of the fears are overblown about the extent to which the High Court might read in this or that. Um, partly because the court always starts with the words, and the words themselves are clear, may make representations. Um, there are no obligations placed upon the executive or parliament. 
And I think it would be a mighty stretch to say, for example, they must be provided with information, they must be given time, because if nothing else, Clause 3 makes it clear that Parliament itself has the power to regulate the procedures, composition, workings of the voice. So it's up to Parliament. If Parliament wants to do that, it could. It could actually say that, yes, executive might provide information, but that's its choice if it wishes to do so. Or it could go the other way in saying, in fact, we remove any capacity even to consider the voice in these contexts because we don't believe the statute under which a decision is made should give rise to it. So the point is, is that the Constitution says it may make representations. Beyond that, it's also very clear in saying that Parliament itself has this general power to regulate these matters, as it should. Um, it leaves it to the politics of the day to resolve those matters satisfactorily. Now, personally, I actually think it's appropriate that decision makers should listen to the voice where they're making decisions that affect Indigenous peoples, where they're making decisions about their communities. And that's, in fact, one of the main reasons for the voice, because the long history of Indigenous affairs in this country shows failure after failure where we have not take into account the impact of government decisions upon the communities affected by those decisions. And what's animating this is the belief and hope that if we start listening to those communities, we'll get better laws, better policies, better expenditure of taxpayers' money, and perhaps we'll turn around a really sorry legacy of policymaking in this area that too often has been about imposing laws and policies to the great detriment of those communities, and I'd have to say to the great failure often of those policies. So I think it should be listened to, but again, it'll be up to Parliament to condition how, when, and whether that actually occurs. Do you want to make a brief comment? Yep. Um, a lot of the uncertainty about that um, can be removed at a stroke. Um, the uncertainty arises because of the proposal to constitutionalise the voice. The voice can be legislated right now. Uh, all these problems about uh, what will the High Court decide um, and the doubts about whether the decisions of Parliament will stick or whether an activist High Court would determine that, no, we disagree with Parliament, the words mean X, while Parliament said they meant Y. Uh, uh, the easiest solution is what I suggested, um, put it, uh, create it as statute, a statute-based body, see how it goes and get a track record in place. I don't think uh, constitutionalising it only adds concern. Question here, Got to be brief. Okay. <laughs> First, it seems that there's going to be a problem. How are you going to define who and who is not an Aboriginal? The second question is that presumably this law is being enacted because Aboriginals, many of them, are said to be at a disadvantage. But then so are transsexual people and so are uh, people who have a disability. Why can't we have a voice to parliament for people who are disabled? Why not a voice to parliament for people who are... Okay, we got it. Okay. Um. <laughs> Response? Yeah, and, and the first thing to say about the voice is the reason this is about uh, Indigenous peoples is they are, are our first peoples. There is no other group with that status in the community. And our nation is formed upon their ancestral lands and the idea behind the voice is it's entirely appropriate that they should be given this opportunity to have a say on laws and policies that affect them because of their unique status. There is no other group with this status. And there is also no other group that has been subjected, particularly through the racist power, as Chris has indicated, to such invidious discrimination over the course of decades. As to who is an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person, the courts have worked out the test there that's accepted, a test based upon dissent, acceptance within the community and the like. That's something Parliament may legislate on. Um, the uh, amendment does not mandate a test of any kind, and it's probably appropriate Parliament does legislate so that over time this is something that we can continue to evolve with community attitudes. Chris, you want to say something? Yeah. Um, I think that's the problem. I think the last thing we want in this country are race laws, uh, race tribunals determining who is an Aborigine and who is not. I don't think we want to go there. I think uh, you, you, get, you take a wrong turn and you abandon equality of citizenship and you, you hit all this nonsense. Uh, race laws are, are just an abomination. Um, they, they should form no part of um, the, the Australian statute book. Thank you. I'm trembling here because uh, Jared may shoot me down, even <laughs> I'm his son-in-law. Uh, 
<laughs> My concern is um, the debate. And this is why I don't trust the people who are leading this. You've seen Noel Pearson. I've been on the, on the attack of that, being called names, uh, race traitors, racist, uh, and stuff like that. So, if and, that, and even having Brett Walker, one of the most uh, greatest legal minds in this country, going down that thing. So, so I just find this funny. So I'd just like to know what your comments about that are. In that, uh, that we got this. I know Aboriginal people who have been threatened with their jobs. I know lawyers have been threatened with their jobs, and I've known a lot of people who are scared to put their view forward. So, uh, you know, I, I live in the real world. I don't live in academia, and uh, I just see that what is happening to people. And look, uh, sadly, academia can get pretty nasty too. But um, I would say, Warren, I, I, I accept what you say, and I think there's more than enough room for a respectful debate. Debate is good. It's a strength of our democracy. It shouldn't be about name-calling. shouldn't be about threatening. There's, there's more than enough room for arguments on both sides. And certainly for me, as you're seeing from Chris and I, it's a respectful debate. We respect each other, and there's room for disagreement in this. So... I also would say that either side engaging in disrespectful behaviour or name calling is probably shooting themselves in the foot in any event. So it's it's not a winning strategy. It's I think what Australians are looking for is they want to understand this proposal. They want to know why. They do want to understand if there are problems with it that we can pick apart and look at. And if there are, we're in this parliamentary process where there's still room for debate, the final proposal hasn't been settled, but they actually want to see people debating this in the right spirit. So I accept where you're coming from. Yes, look, I think the, the problem arises from the, the process and I, I don't um, blame the leaders uh, of the Indigenous Working Group. I blame the government for setting it up, for structuring things so that uh, an interest group was given control of, the, of working towards a referendum. They should have been reporting to the government and the government should have remained in control. They've, they've got a lot invested in this. Uh, many of them are not um, impartial lawyers um, and take things very personally. Um, so I think it's a structural problem. My name's Gillis Bronowski. There have been mention tonight of a number of items in our constitution that are unhelpful to Aboriginal people. How can we have a referendum on this matter, voice, without addressing those matters in the Constitution at the same time. And they're not just unhelpful, they, are, they, write racial, they write racial discrimination into the DNA of our Constitution. And as I say, I'm not aware of any Constitution left in the world that has the sort of clauses we still have in our Constitution that permits the states to disenfranchise people with their race, stated overtly, and a race-based power to make laws because of a person's race and to fix upon them negative consequences and put there deliberately for that purpose. And I suppose this is where, when I think of what Chris has said, I mean, I, I think we have a racially discriminatory system as it is. It's written into the Constitution. We've seen many laws enacted on the basis of that which have suspended the Racial Discrimination Act only to enable discrimination against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. That's happened a few times. And they have been the only group subjected to that power in the Constitution. Um, one of the things I did as a barrister was appear in the Hindmarsh Island Bridge case where we argued to the High Court, we tried to get a creative interpretation to say perhaps it can't be used for racially discriminatory purposes anymore, but the High Court said no, we stick to the words, it's not permitted to read positive intent, the framers did not intend it. And it both illustrates a problem but also gives comfort that we don't have a particularly radical court in this country, particularly compared to other places. And if the words cannot give rise to something, there's just no scope um, to read it in. When it comes to how to deal with those clauses, Indigenous peoples met at Uluru, faced with exactly the issues they're saying. And what they said they wanted, as Indigenous peoples of the country, was the voice. They said they wanted to apply political pressure. They didn't want the courts. They wanted to have a say so that Parliament would listen to them and their representations before using the racist power, that they wanted to insert themselves in that political process when decisions about laws are being made. And so rather than going for a judicial or a high court outcome, they went for a political outcome.
which is somewhat ironic given where the debate has turned, because their purpose was to get a political outcome, to win through force of argument and influence through a voice. And I think that's actually the right way to go. It built on our political processes. And much of the debate about the High Court is really at the margins. In the end, this is a voice about having a say, having influence. And if in the end they don't speak with influence, they won't win the debate. It's that simple. Because no one can be forced to obey or listen. No one can be forced to take into account a veto. It's the power of the voice through representation. That's, that's what they would have. Brief response? Um, look, I, I share your concern. I, I think uh, a modern constitution, there should be no place for race at all. Uh, simple as that. I'm, I'm surprised that we're not debating removing all references to race. Rather, instead, what we're doing is talking about creating a new one um, uh, with the best of intentions by its proponents. But the consequences, I would argue, are, are so adverse as to make it something we shouldn't even consider. What we should be considering is getting rid of the existing race-based elements in the Constitution. No, just before, hang on just a second. No, 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 we've got to move on. No, we've got to move on. Okay. We've got to move on. Now, just before I, we take that one, I just want to say there's one coming in on the Zoom, and the question is, I don't think it's kind of an ironic question, would, would the voice be able to make recommendations to the government or to the Governor-General about the appointment of High Court judges and Federal Court judges? Um, I mean... If it, if it, for example, wanted to recommend Indigenous person, probably could. Um, but whether it's completely ignored, and people do that all the time. Um, the thing is that people make comments and representations, but if it starts making representations about matters that aren't given great weight, it undermines its political influence. And in the end, that, the, the body will live and die, not according to what the High Court says, but whether it's influential. And so if it goes into areas with which it's not going to have much influence or seen as not a credible voice, then it will harm the endeavour. Right. So yes, it can say lots of things, but whether it has any impact, that's up to Parliament and the executive of the day. Quick response? Yes. Um, uh, judicial appointments should always be based on merit. They should always be made by the executive, and the executive should wear the consequences for good or for ill. And when we start making judicial appointments on the basis of race, we're in deep trouble. Now, we've got, we're running out of time, so we've got two questions, one from Gabriel and one from Geraldine. Okay, okay. they've got to be brief, okay? It will be brief. Thank you very much, Chris, and to George. That was my question that was just asked then. But just really a comment, if I may, would be to say that having served as a minister, um, some prescription of what representations to government by the voice are would be very helpful because I can see that decision-making in some way being slowed down if it were not prescribed. You want to make anyone want to make a comment? Yeah, I just say I agree, and that's why Parliament has been given this power directly to deal with the procedures, composition, the workings of the voice, to do exactly that, and better to do that than put it in the Constitution, which would say this is how it is for however long. It means Parliament can set it down and change it as needed based upon experience. Quick response? Uh, if it sticks. It depends on uh, whether, whether Parliament's uh, uh, formula for what should happen is actually going to stick with the, the High Court. As I said, the, the formula in the, the government's final provision is fairly open-ended. It leaves far too much room, wiggle room, I would say, for the High Court to impose its own interpretation. Oh, just very quickly, um, if, to George, I think, that very good point about Section 51 could all be avoided, you know, Chris's point about um, the logical request that be heard before Section 51 is invoked. Could we imagine that affecting the course of the next six weeks in the parliamentary inquiry, together with a sense of recognition in the, in the Constitution, you know, some form of ramp? I mean, could we imagine a That sounds so logical, so sensible. And, and the reason it unfortunately doesn't work, and I'm someone who's argued for a long time we have a problem with the race power and we need to fix it, but the reason it doesn't work is because the High Court has enabled these discriminatory laws also to be passed under other powers as well. So it's actually not just the race power, it could be the tax power, it could be the corporation's power. In fact, any of these powers can be used to legislate for Indigenous matters, and that's just the way the High Court has interpreted those powers. So you'd actually need to attach this advisory body to every power of the Commonwealth, and that's what the voice does. That's in the end why they've gone down that path. 
Otherwise, you'd end up with, yes, provide advice just on the racist power, but not on every other power that might be used to legislate about Indigenous peoples. Chris? Uh, and that's the problem. I, I, uh, I don't see the legitimacy in allowing a non-elected group based on its race to present, uh, to have a second say, if you like, uh, a preferential say on laws that have nothing to do with Indigenous people or marginal, a marginal impact on Indigenous people. There's no real limitation, uh, and there should be, if there's going to be a voice, at the very least, it, it should be, its reach should be limited to matters that relate specifically to Indigenous people. And while we've seen that in the, uh, mem uh, the memorandum accompanying the bill, and we've seen it in uh, a speech made by the Attorney General in Parliament, it's, it's not in the wording that would be part of the Constitution. We have time for one last quick question. Brian, what, what, what would happen in the future if some hostile parliament that's disillusioned with the voice so constrains its activities to render it almost voiceless? Could the High Court then intervene and say that constraint is unconstitutional? Uh, and the reason that Indigenous peoples want this to be in the Constitution is to preserve a guaranteed right against the wishes of a hostile parliament that the voice would, one, exist, and two, can continue to make representations to Parliament and the Executive. So a hostile Parliament could not remove those things, but it could, as you say. I mean, there's enough power there to deal with its budget, its composition, its procedures, that even though it might have that ability, you know, it could be so severely constrained as to ultimately become quite ineffective. That's the risk, giving Parliament these extra powers. Final comment? Uh, very briefly, um, if a future Parliament adopts a hostile view to uh, an institution of state, normally uh, we'd be inclined to um, hold the parliament responsible for that, and either it's got a good case or a bad case. But if uh, the views of the parliament, which is our parliament, uh, don't prevail, uh, we lose a way of holding a new institution to account. Many thanks, Chris. Just step back. So we, we always finish on time, so we're finishing on time tonight. I thought it was a terrific discussion, very respectful, and it's interesting that two columnists from the Australian have quite different views, and they're good, they're good mates, which is, which is not balance you get everywhere in this country, I must say, having said that. So I just want to say thanks to uh, George Williams and to Chris Merritt. As I said, Chris has got an article, uh, an essay in this book, Beyond Belief, and Warren Mundine, who made a contribution from the floor tonight, he's the co-editor, and we're going to get George back with... Um, Megan Davis, when his book comes out, it better be before October. So there we are. But for tonight, um, well done to both of you and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you.